And let the peace of God rule in your hearts To the which also ye are called in one body And be ye thankful Be ye thankful Yes, Father, we come and sit now at your feet to listen to your words, Lord, as we remember the church that started after Pentecost, the first thing they did was to devote themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Lord, if we do not hear your word and take it in and make it our own, we will remain weak. We will remain powerless. And so, Lord, let us come not only to hear, but to understand and to apply and to move in the spirit that your word promises that we get when we call out to you. And so, Father, speak to us individually today. Let, let the message I hear not be for the person next to me, but let it be for me. Speak to me today, Lord. I ask you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. We are in a sermon series and, um, in the mornings about being the body of Christ. And that the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at all the gifts, the, the gifts of the Spirit. And there are still a couple of gifts we're not going to look at now. Um, we did look at them in detail a couple of years back, so if you want to look at the gifts of giving, um, what that simply is, is that God enables some people to make a lot of money. We know those people. And the moment they become children of God, they don't stop being able to make money, but they start understanding that my money is not my own. And that's true for all of us, not just the people who make lots of money. But God enables some people to make money to support ministries. That's a spiritual gift given in the, in the Bible. The gift of leadership, the gift of administration, many other gifts you can go find there. So why, why are we looking at all these gifts? Well, firstly, we want to get the clear picture from God's Word about what it should be. Satan is having a field day in so many churches where the gifts are becoming something that they are not defined as in God's Word. And the people say, well, it feels spiritual. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. Don't you think He is the one who's saying how it should happen in His Word? And so we want this clear picture, but, but even more, I hope we develop a hunger for what church could be. For what church is intended to be. And what happens when the body starts loving and caring and working together like they should. Like we find in the Church of Acts. Where they cared for each other, they shared, they loved, they ministered. Um, like Paul often in his letters, when he writes, then he writes and he says, Man, it fills me with so much joy to see you walking in the Spirit. To see you following God. And, and I feel the same way when I hear about people in our church who take up this power of the Spirit and walk in it. This morning I got a message, not this morning, but for this morning. I got a message from Johan and Marina to say they sadly can't be here today so they're making apology for the AGM because where they live at the Odemiel in Riversdale, he is the only person allowed to go into the frail care to bring their messages of God. And I said, listen, I never want to take you away from that. Please don't come this morning. Please go and do what God is equipping you to do. And I mean, it's not yet to mention names, but when I hear our people in this church are stepping out in faith. We've had so many testimonies this year of people who speak to strangers in a restaurant, pray for them, and when they go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, you don't need an operation anymore. This is the church working like it should be. But just like the Church of Acts, it's not true of everyone. It's not true of everyone here. I've heard, I've had people in the church tell me, oh, I like everyone except this one and this one and this one. Now, I wonder what they think I must make with information like that. Must I go, oh, yeah, oh, that's good, that's fine. Or should I say, oh, whoa, 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 go do something about it. And to hear again, it wasn't the first time, that, well, this person and this person don't do things together. So don't organize things with these two people from our church. We will place them in the same room. That's just sad. That's just not how it should be. Um, why was it so different in Acts? Why, what happened that made it so different for them to be able to change, 
to become loving, to become caring, to become self-sacrificing, to sell what I have and just give the money to the poor. What changed? Pentecost came. The Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came and it filled them and it baptized them. Insomuch that the whole society looked at them and said, there's something different here. There's something good here. And Jesus prophesied. Jesus prophesied that, that that day would come. And so you can open your Bibles to John 7. John 7, we're going to read from verse 37 to 39. Pauline will read for us this morning, but before we read together, let's just pray. Lord, I, I know that today's message is again one of those that scratch perhaps where we don't want to be scratched. We challenge us where we perhaps want to ignore areas of our lives. But Lord, again, as I prayed earlier, let this not be a message that I hear for the person next to me. Let me search my own heart before you. Let me become honest before you and say, am I who I could be if I were walk and are filled with the Spirit? And Lord, if not, let us not just carry on. We desire to be your people. We desire to be your body. We desire to be filled with your spirit. And Lord, so we thank you for that in your wonderful name. We thank you that we can all come and ask you for it. And know that you will do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this is said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Thank you, Pauline. If you look there in the verse 37, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day. Now this was the eighth day of the, the great feast. And we read about it in Leviticus 23 verse 39. And this day was a Sabbath, and it was the last feast day of the year, and it was distinguished by remarkable ceremonies. I mean, this was the... This was December and still by for them. This was the time when Jerusalem was pumping, when everyone went there. When they had these religious gatherings, these religious things that happened. It says here, the general joyous character of the feast. So the whole feast of the eight days were characterized by joyfulness, by happiness. The general, generally joyous character of this feast broke out on this day, the eighth day, last day, into loud jubilation. Particularly at the solemn moment when the priest, as was done on every day of this festival, brought forth in golden vessels... Water from the stream of Shiloh, which flowed under the temple mountain, and solemnly poured it upon the altar. So this, it says solemn twice. This man, priest guy, would come with his water that he carefully gather, gathered from the pool of Shiloh, and he's coming to the altar to pour it on the altar. And the guys are cheering him on, and they are just so happy. And this is what happened then. Then they would sing the words of Isaiah 12, verse 3, that said, With joy shall ye draw. Water out of the wells of salvation. And another commentator said, So ecstatic was the joy with which this ceremony was performed, accompanied with sound of trumpet, that it used to be said, Whoever had not witnessed it had never seen rejoicing at all. Now think in our world, I wouldn't even know what to think of. That, those great parties, those times of ecstatic joy and singing and happiness, and that wasn't for them. For them, that was going there and experiencing this. But what happens on this day? Jesus stands up on this greatest day of joy and he says, If anyone thirsts. Now that's strange. Because obviously he's not talking about real water here. He knows. Because that's how the Spirit works. He knows there are people there who is part of this religious joy. 
And man, this moment is such a high. And they know, you know, tomorrow I'm going back to my home and this is going to be the same again. I'm just going to be who I am for a whole year until this happens again. And, and I think for many of them, year after year, there must, must have been this hunger to say, this can't be it. This moment that we call in our calendar the greatest joy, this can't be it. This can't be what life is about. And it's for those people that Jesus looks at them and says, if anyone thirsts. Now that's a question for you today. You could have been in this church for 20 years. Some of you, 90 years. If we, if we lost it, that, if we've been all that old. And you've had it all. You've seen it all. You've experienced everything that this church has to offer. But you're still thirsty. You still look at, at what life is and what you experience and you say, this can't be it. This can't be it. There has to be something more. Now what is Jesus saying about the people who are thirsty? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus' solution is don't have another festival. Don't have a bigger festival. Don't get bigger trumpets. Come to me. Come to me and drink. Now how does this drinking happen? happen? We read there in verse 38, it says, Whoever believes in me, that's where it starts. You cannot drink if you don't believe. You cannot drink if you don't believe. And how sickening it is that Satan got it right in the hearts of so many people and churches that belief has become this tiny little decision. This mere little mental thought and a choice that I make. Um, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. But they know nothing of denying themselves. They know nothing about taking up their cross. They know nothing about climbing off the throne of their lives. They know nothing of doing something about this pride that just fills their heart. They know nothing about um, changing. All they know is that, oh well, now I tick the Christian checkbox. They know nothing about following Jesus. When you've taken that first step of true belief, true surrender, then something happens. If you come to Jesus, something happens, and it says it there, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You know, a fountain is much better than water under the ground. Water that just sits there. When that water bursts out and becomes a fountain, it has so much goodness that it brings with it. I mean, I always have that picture of Moses. Now I must say, many years I've had this idea that Moses was standing there with a rock and he like tapped a little rock and the size of a little tap water came out of that rock and they all drank. Until I saw that one picture that we have, one of our songs, where he smacks this rock, man, and this massive amount of water came out. And I thought, that makes far more sense for the hundreds and thousands of people that they were. And that's a picture here. Jesus says, you know, if you, if you come right, if you come in the right way to me, it's not just a little decision and your life carries on as normal. Something changes. Not just in you, but out of you. Your words, your thoughts, your actions, the way you treat other people, the way you think about other people. Everything changes if you get this right. And then John goes on and he gives us a bit more clarity about what Jesus meant about this living water. In verse 39 he said, now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John is saying, Jesus is speaking about Pentecost. Jesus is speaking about that moment when you come to him in faith and ask, and he gives you the Spirit. The living water is drinking from the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this affilling effect all of you. You grow in power, you grow in love, you grow in the fruit of the Spirit, and then add it on, He gives you the gifts of the Spirit. And there's a, that has been the problem of studying the gifts of the Spirit like this. The problem of studying the gifts of the Spirit one after the other is that we can become so focused on these gifts. Now one of my children who will remain nameless for my own health benefits, um, 
I remember one Christmas, we started handing out gifts, and this kid became frenetic. Another one! I want another one! And it was just about ripping gifts over and having another one, I want another one. And we're like, oh, we'll step away from this person for a while. And you know what? That could happen with the gifts of the Spirit as well. We become so focused on how cool it looks and the amazing things that happen and people that are healed that we focus on the gifts and not on the gift giver. And that's where we miss the plot. We need to come to Jesus to drink from Him so that the Holy Spirit can come and fill us, change us, make us something different, and then we can be a benefit to other people. Focus on the gift giver, not the gift. The gift is secondary. The gift giver is primary. Now, if you struggle today with your walk with Jesus, with your life, with what's going on inside you, there are a couple of things you need. You need to believe in Jesus. Any country where Christianity is the culture will have people who have no clue what it means to be a Christian. Because it's just the thing. Because there will be so many fake Christians around. The Bible says it's a radical step of giving everything over to Jesus. To see Him for who He is. That He's Jesus. That He's God. That He's the boss. That I must turn my back to my old life and beg Him to forgive me. It's not like, oh Jesus, I'm now here. You must be so glad to have someone as clever as me and your team now. No, it's to fall on your knees and to beg Him to forgive you. Because you don't deserve it. You don't deserve anything. But He's good and He will do it. He will forgive you. He will give you life. He will give you a new heart. He will make you born again. And once you believe, you come to the Spirit and you drink. And that's where we need to be. Now, this drinking, it annoys me when Satan takes something that is so beautiful and tries to confuse it in the church. And he does it so often to distort it. Now, that's the same with this receiving of the Spirit. The same with this baptizing and the filling of the Spirit. It is amazing. It is wonderful. It is what we need. It is the start of revival, both personal and for a group. But we've made it so complicated. And we have all these groups disagreeing that says, okay, now, now you don't have the Spirit yet, and now you have Him, but you still need the baptism. But now you have been baptized, so you need to stop complaining, but you haven't been filled. And it becomes so very complicated. And yes, we need to have that moment when Christ becomes alive in us. But it leads to so many other struggles where people have had that moment and they were filled with all these good things I'm talking about now. They were filled with a joy. They were filled with a power. They were filled with the energy. And then a couple of years down the line, they find themselves in a ditch again and they wonder what's happened. What happened now? What happened now? We see this in the Word. We see people who were filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, and then they fall back. We have Peter, the man who had the boldness to stand before those guys who just killed Jesus. And what does he tell them? You are the horrible people who killed Jesus. You Jews, you are the problem. How could he do that other than being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? And yet, a couple of years later, we find him being so scared of what the Jews think that he stops eating with the Gentiles in case he might offend them. And Paul needs to come to him and says, Peter, what's going on? Where's bold Peter? Where's ferociously, violently, perfectly following Jesus Peter? What happened? We have this with Barnabas and Paul. Filled with the Spirit, on fire, down the line, they fight so much they can't even work together anymore. They have to split up. I have to go in two different directions. We have it with Timothy. Timothy, this young guy who was said to be the pastor of the church, he gets so scared that he wants to hide away. And Paul needs to write to them and says, fan into flame the gift that you have received. So it gets complicated. Was Timothy now never baptized in the Spirit? Was he baptized and he lost it? And must he be baptized again? So I want to uncomplicate it today. And I'm hoping I can do this. Spirit, help me. Once you're a child of God, there's one question you ask yourself. 
Is the Spirit working powerfully in me now? If the answer is no, the question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Don't make it complicated by, yes, but ten years ago and three years. No! If you look at your personal life, if you look at the people in the church that you refuse to share a room with, if you look at your relationship with your spouse, with your kids, if you look at the way you deal with your money, if you look at the way you deal with your time, ask yourself, am I filled and walking in the power of the Spirit today? And if not, what are you going to do about it? There's a beautiful passage in the Bible that teaches us what to do about it. And we're going to look at it. We look at it so often, but man, we're going to keep on looking at it until Jesus comes again. This is from Acts 4, verse 27. Peter and them have just been arrested. The church where Pentecost happened now experienced trouble. Suddenly, at, at first the community loved them. At first everyone accepted them and it turned like this. And you'll see now here, everyone hates them at this moment. Read there. They come together and they say, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Jewish king, Pontius Pilate, Roman emperor, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Everyone is against us. They face this and they're becoming scared. That's what we read in the context here. They're looking at life around them and they're becoming scared. And so what do they do in verse 28? To do, and now they pray to God to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You know what is beautiful about this? Is that everything about their experience with the Holy Spirit is not gone. They are different people. They see God differently. They look at all their trouble and they say, well, you predestined it. You're in charge. You're still God. You're still king. But they are struggling. Now, now who are the they again? Let's remind ourselves. It's the day you received the Holy Spirit. It's the day you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's the day you've been filled in the Holy Spirit. And now they're scared. And so what do they do? They pray until something happens. They pray until something happens. Read there, verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Lord, they are threatening us and we don't feel so bold anymore. We don't feel so strong anymore. We want to continue in this boldness, but we don't have it. While you, Jesus, stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So what are they doing? They're realizing we are not in the power of the Spirit in, at this moment. And all they do is they go back to Jesus. They go back to the well to drink. Because that's where the solution lies. And what happens? I love verse 31. And then when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They realized in this moment, we are not where we should be. And they prayed until they are where they should be again. And this was different. There were no tongues this time. They didn't go out and speak to other people at this right moment like they did with Pentecost. But they had the power just to carry on. They had the power just to keep on doing the good thing that they have been doing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is such a wonderful concept that we are, it's so difficult to put it in a box. Because everyone experiences it differently. It's not predominantly an emotional thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's God grabbing hold of you on the inside and shaking you and cleansing you and giving you power. And for some, that will be an emotional moment and they will shout it from the rooftops. And for another personality type, will just be quietly walking in the power of the Spirit, doing what they need to do. You know, one of the frustrating things for a pastor is that I can't convict people of sin. Um, I can't. It's not in my job description, so I shouldn't even try it's the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin. I must just preach the truth in love and then hope that the Holy Spirit will convict. And it's sad when you preach and it feels like you're just hitting a wall with some people. 
When we started this series on being the body of Christ, we looked at the passage just before 1 Corinthians 12. So in sequence, preaching through the text, and it spoke about cutting out the cancer. It spoke about, if you bring, it spoke about the division in the church, disunity. And we looked at that passage that says, if you bring your offering to the church, and they realize that there's someone in the church that you have an offense with, then go and sort it out. And again, I'm so thankful for this church where God is working. But I do wonder why some of you are still here. Doesn't this take same as good do something? Doesn't this take say, go do something unless you have a very good excuse not to? Or unless you're scared to? Or unless that other person is obviously the guilty one? Go and do something about it. And if you don't have the power to do something about it, go drink from the well of living water until you have the power to do something about it. But we can't, we can't carry on like this. So yes, the Holy Spirit is there. And we need it. We need the power of the Spirit. We need it. Without it, we're nothing. Without it, we're weak. Without it, we're just a social club who gather together for coffee on a Sunday. We need the Spirit. Now again, the filling of the Spirit isn't the once-off solution that fixes everything. If it was, the New Testament would have been this thing. It would have just said, oh, be filled, that's it. It's more than that. The Holy Spirit fills you to do what you need to do. And you still need guidance. You still need to do it. Now I, two years ago I think, for my birthday got a chainsaw. Now you're only a real man when you have a chainsaw, I think. Or you only feel like a real man when you have a chainsaw. Now I've got a petrol chainsaw. And holding the chainsaw is one thing. Man, that you already feel like half a man. But the moment you put that petrol in and you start it, man, you feel that power. But the thing is, I can start it and hold it, nothing is going to happen. Nothing. My arms will get tired. It's quite heavy. You need to be a strong man to be a real man. Um, now that I have the power, I have to do something with it. I have to go chop a tree. Hopefully not get overboard and start chopping the furniture. But I have to do something with this power that's now been given to me. And you know what? I think the Holy Spirit is like that. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is petrol. Please don't. This is an analogy. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's a God. But I'm talking about the infilling of the Spirit is like putting that petrol into the chainsaw and then switching it on and everything is different. You feel it is different. You know it's different. You have the power to do things that you were not able to do. Because if you ever tried cutting something down with a chainsaw that's not started... Oh my goodness, you might as well use a butter knife rather. But once the power is there, it's there and you have to use it now. You have to go and ask forgiveness. You have to go and do what you need to do. You have to go and sort out your sin. But that's not the end of the story. Because I had this chainsaw for a while and then one day I pulled the string and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I did... All the, what does real men do when they have a problem? They go look at YouTube videos and figure out what the problem is. And I cleaned the spark plug and I did this and I made sure the oil was there in the petrol and this thing just didn't want to stop. And then I found a video that says the problem is most probably, now what will the real men say? Oh, where are all the real men? Old petrol. Old petrol. That was the only problem. So I had to throw the petrol out put new petrol in and it started like a dream again. And you know, sometimes when we're living with the Spirit, we start neglecting the Holy Spirit. And obviously the Holy Spirit can't get old like petrol. But because we're not focused on Him, we are so focused on what we are doing, we're forgetting where the power lies. And then we go, stop, stop everything. Come back to the power. Fix the problem. If you are today not where you should be, what are you going to do about it? Now, for some of you, it means you have to be saved. You're not saved. It's as simple as that. You're not saved. But even if you are saved, 
They were saved. They've been baptized with the Spirit and they were scared. And they went back to drink. They went back to pray. If you are not where you should be today, walking in the power of the Spirit, what are you going to do about it? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we are so thankful that it's all about you and that you are sitting on the throne in heaven, that you are interceding for us with the Father, that you take our prayers in perfection to him. But on this side, we're often struggling. On this side, we are, we are weak. We are struck down. We are perplexed. All these things Paul says about himself. And we are so thankful, Holy Spirit, that you are the one who is on this side of our prayers with us. That you're the one next to us who, who calls out when we don't even have the words to call out. You are a paracletos, the one calling out next to us, the one who carries us when we are weak. And Lord, today our prayer is that we will not neglect the gift giver. Help us to focus on you, Holy Spirit. When we are not where we should be, Jesus, we want to come to you and pray until you fill us again with the Spirit. Lord, thank you for our church. I don't want to sound negative about the large part of the church because I know you are doing so many good things. But you also say a couple of things can make the whole cart go fraught. And so Lord, we come today that once again, I don't listen for the person next to you. I listen for me. And to ask, am I where I need to be? And if not, Lord, that we will go and set time aside like these disciples did and pray until they know they can carry on again. Lord, I, I want to pray if there's any disunity and fights, that you will help us what to do. And, and Lord, I know sometimes we've done all we could. And then we just have to say it's in your hands now. But sometimes we don't do what we should. And remind us again today that by the love we have for each other, the world will know that we are truly your disciples. Without that love, the world is not going to know. And so we pray. Holy Spirit, we come and ask now that you will fill us. That you will empower us. Lord, it is a chiseling work. It's a painful work to deal with the Holy Spirit. To give up what we need to give up. But it's free. It's empowering. It's wonderful. The light is so bright when we walk in your footsteps. So Lord, speak to us today and work in us. Do that change that we cannot do. We cannot bring the power. You need the power from you. And so we pray this all in your wonderful name. Amen. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful.